Right, when you see pictures like these of human groups moving along, or insects, fish schools, or bird flocks, you might ask the question, how do they actually function? How do the individuals interact within these groups to produce these patterns? And how can they agree on a common direction of locomotion? There are three simple principles that operate in most cases. The first one is the individuals are attracted to each other. And when they come a bit closer in space, they begin to face in the same direction. And the third one, to avoid collisions, they move away from each other. They keep a certain distance from each other. So here we see, in summary, again, these three types of interaction. The zone of repulsion is actually uh, beautifully demonstrated by many of you. Um, everybody keeps a bit, a bit of space. I don't actually see many people touching at the moment. Another important component of... Oh, yeah, there are some now. <laughs> um, another important component of collective behavior is self-organization. So individuals like this fish that you can see here, it will interact only with local near neighbors, and only just a few of them. So it doesn't need to know about everybody in the school of fish, it only responds to a few near neighbors, and if all individuals in the group do this, then this can organize the entire school of fish. Now, <clears throat> when the animals begin to move through their environment, they will begin to interact with the environment. They will see predators in the environment that they try to avoid. They might see food items that they want to consume. But usually only a few individuals will discover these stimuli in the environment. And the question is now how they can lead the entire group um, either away from a predator or towards food. And we see here, a, uh, a model, a simulation by Ian Cousin from Princeton University, who looked at this problem in more detail. And we simulated here groups of 10 to about 200 um, individuals and investigated the question, how many leaders does it take to guide a group? And if you look at the smaller picture first, you will see it takes only about five to 10 individuals to lead groups of very different sizes with very high accuracy. So this is quite surprising, because we had expected you would need far more individuals to guide these bigger groups. If you look at the bigger picture, you can see that the consequence of this fairly constant number of leaders is that the required proportion of individuals to guide a group actually goes down as group size goes up. Now, this is a computer simulation, and, but of course we need to test things in real life. So, in order to test these simulations, we developed a robotic fish. It's actually quite small, it might look big on the screen. It's a stickleback kind of fish you can find in the rivers and streams here in Belgium as well. And this model here is accepted by live fish as a conspecific, so one of their own, but we can control it from a computer. Now, let's see what this uh, robotic fish can do. This is a, uh, a top-down view, 10 fish in the tank, the robot amongst them. And we make it move in a very robotic way, so you can uh, detect it and see its influence which happens about now. So as you can see, it's turning the entire school of fish around, and it's actually guiding them back into the box where they came from. So probably a fisherman's dream to have one of these and <laughs> operate them in the open ocean. I'm sure our problems in the North Sea with overfishing would be far worse. This thing only operates in the lab. Nevertheless, I think a convincing demonstration here, 10% or one individual guides a group of 10. So what can we use this robotic fish for? And I want to show you an experiment which we conducted with Ashley Ward from Sydney University. We introduced a number of fish at the bright end of the tank 
and they want to move to the gray zone, the darker end of the tank, and in doing so, they have to make a right-left decision. And we can bias this decision now by putting a predator, for instance, on one side that they want to avoid, or some food that they want to consume. And now we can take the robot and actually show maladaptive bad choices with a robot. So the robot will try to guide the fish to the predator and away from the food. And surprisingly, a single live fish will actually follow the robot. So it will go to the predator and it will go away from food. But interestingly, the moment the fish are in a group of two, four or more fish, they will disregard, in most cases, these bad choices by the robotic fish and they will make collectively a better choice. And that's already the first indication here that there is such a thing as swarm intelligence because the group is making choices that the individual can't. And let's um, see this because seeing is believing in these cases. The robot guides the fish to their favorite food, the blood worms. Then it tries to move them away. One fish hesitates for a moment, but then also goes to the food. So in this case, when the leader demonstrates a risky or maladaptive behavior, they ignore it. <clears throat> so let's turn to the behavior of humans now. Do we see similar principles in operation when we look at human groups? And we looked at small groups of our own students at first <clears throat> in uh, experimental situations, and we asked them to walk at a normal walking speed to keep within about arm's length of each other and not to talk or gesture in this experiment. And then there's a little trick, just like with a robotic fish, we have one individual in this group and this person's assignment is to move in a particular direction to a particular location in this room, but without leaving the group behind. Okay? And it's quite tough because you can't gesture and you can't tell them, follow me or anything, you have to use other more subtle means um, of doing this. So this is a bit similar to a situation um, uh, that you might see at airports or train stations where strangers interact with each other. And we found that um, our students were very good at this kind of task. They can guide a group very effectively and quickly in the right direction. And this uh, made us bold because uh, we predicted in these simulations that we can go to large groups of hundreds of individuals and we tried this. We looked at a group of 200 volunteers who came to Cologne one day to participate in this experiment and we had 10 leaders within this group that were trying to guide this group in a particular direction and these leaders don't know about each other and uh, of course, the others don't know that there are any leaders present. And as you can see in the video, this worked quite beautifully. It takes a while for the group to polarize. The leaders go to the front, and then gradually they move the entire group to the target location. And the people who are guided don't even realize that there are any leaders in this group. Now, what does it look like if you uh, don't have any leaders in this group, so they just walk and they stay within about arm's length of each other. Well, what we get here is what we call a torus. It's a ring structure and it even has lane formation, as you can see in one of the pictures. They walk clockwise or anti-clockwise <clears throat> and people often started laughing when this happened. They were trying to break the torus, but individually this is actually quite difficult. So we get a seemingly complex um, a global pattern from very simple um, local interactions of people. Now, you could say these experiments are a bit contrived because we do this inside um, buildings, we give these people particular behavioral rules that they have to follow. Now, let's look at human behavior in the wild, so to speak. Um, when humans try to cross roads, for instance, you see an example here from a, a British city, the light for the pedestrians is red, for the cars it's green, but as you know, there are always some people who are not patient, they just cross anyway the moment they see a gap. And 
if I can have my first simulation, please, there are different possibilities now. Other people might spot the same gap in the traffic and they independently start walking. Okay, that's the picture we see here. And if I have the, uh, the second simulation, please. If um, people show a collective response, that means that they respond to near neighbors, as I explained in the beginning, and this produces an entirely different pattern. The first person starts walking, they respond to near neighbors, and you get this kind of wave-like pattern. And this is indeed what we see in most um, cases, and not just in, uh, in the UK, but also on, on the continent. And uh, in Germany, you get punished for this, by the way, if you jaywalk. And when we looked at this wave-like pattern, we realized that the last people that crossed, well, I mean, the gap was long gone by then. And some of these people actually did get hit by cars. I mean, we, we filmed this, and it was pretty dangerous to see this. And I thought, these people must be crazy. I mean, why do they walk into the road when there is no gap anymore? And when we finished these experiments, I packed up all the equipment, walked with my PhD student back to the university. We had to wait at a road crossing. The light was red. I was talking to my students. Somebody on my left side started walking. I followed, and I nearly got run over. That's when I realized um, that what's happening there is you even when you're in conversation, you just observe other people from the corner of your eye. And if they begin to walk, you copy and then you check. But by then, you're often in the road already. So even studying this kind of stuff is not necessarily a protection against stupid behavior. Anyway, I mean, I explained to you so far how collective behavior works. And I gave examples of swarm intelligent behavior, these clever fish that ignore the bad leader. But I also gave you an example of swarm stupidity, people walking into the road and when they can get run over. So the question is, of course, how can we get swarm intelligence? And I listed here three criteria. The first one is individuals need to independently collect information in their environment. The second one is they need to interact with each other, or we can also do that through an algorithm, as I will show in a moment. And the third one is this interaction needs to provide a solution to a cognitive problem that could not be implemented by isolated individuals. Now let's take a closer look at the conditions under which swarm intelligence operates. In a German museum in the center of Berlin, we uh, conducted an experiment. We showed to the visitors two questions, and they could type their answers into a computer. And the first question was, try and estimate the number of marbles in this jar. So they typed this in. We can take later on a mean or a median or something of these answers. And the other one was a combinatorics question. How often do you need to cross a toy so that uh, when you always get heads and not tail, this probability will become so small, like winning in uh, the German lotto, which is like 1 in 14 million or so. So let's have a look. <clears throat> well, if you take a mean of the opinions for the uh, marble estimation, you will find that um, there is a lot of swarm intelligence, a lot of potential. These people got extremely close to the correct answer collectively. Some people overestimate, others underestimate. Together, they get very close. However, for the coin tossing problem, their answers were totally hopeless. I mean, they were way out. The correct answer is 24, and they estimated, I mean, that it might take hundreds or thousands of throws to achieve this. So if we look at the probability to get a good answer that comes close to the real one, as a function of the group size, we see that the more people we ask, for the marble problem, the more likely we are to get a good answer. For the coin tossing problem, it's the opposite. There's absolutely no swarm intelligence potential in there. So when you want to solve a tough problem and you ask yourself, um, 
Is swarm intelligence, uh, could it be helpful for this? You should ask yourself maybe, is it more of a marble estimation problem or more of a coin tossing problem? But I think we all know that estimating numbers of marbles is not a pressing problem in society. So what makes swarm intelligence so attractive? And I just want to give you one example here. And this is by uh, the company Lego. They make these little plastic bricks. I'm sure you're familiar with them. So they realized at some point that many toys in the past were developed by users, like the surfboard and skateboard and so on, and not by professional designers. And so they thought, why don't we ask LEGO users worldwide to give us their design ideas for new toys for the mass market of the future? They created an internet platform where people could input these ideas, they vote on each other's designs, and they develop them, and in this way, LEGO very cleverly harvested the collective creativity of this user community. And this has been copied by a number of companies around the world, and this is one way in which you can, um, for instance, make new toys or design new cars. Volkswagen did this for the uh, car market in China, for instance. But swarm intelligence can also be used in other ways to, for instance, help forecast political elections or, for instance, to change the management structure of companies to go from a more hierarchical model to a collective one to make a company a bit more swarm-like, maybe. So if you were faced with this problem now, can swarm intelligence contribute to decisions that I have to make? I think you should consider a number of criteria, I listed four of them. So the first one is the opinions <coughs> of people uh, should be such that they're really able to judge the problem. Um, there should be independent information coming from these individuals. Ideally, there should be diversity of approaches so that you get different perspectives on this problem. And you need to get honest answers. People shouldn't be lying or influenced by wishful thinking. So if these four criteria are fulfilled, you have no guarantee that swarm intelligence will work for you, but you certainly have a very high probability that it might be helpful in future. Thank you very much.